Take your Bible, turn to John 15, because I'm going to use that to preach this morning. Or you can get up and leave. Whichever, whichever one you want. No, they're, they're getting ready. They got it. it. It only takes me five minutes to get out of here. It takes them longer. So they're going to feed the kids and get them all ready to go so we can get on the road. John chapter 15, verse 7. The Bible, Jesus said, now this is where I ended up last Sunday. And I'm going to start from here and we're going to move on. I'm going to teach you something about God and about how easy it is to love Him. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. This Bible's right. Jesus was not lying when he said that. This is not charismatic word, faith, name it, claim it, garbage. But if you'll read the Bible, you'll know how, you'll know what to pray for. When you read the Bible, you get wise on what to pray for. And when you pray for the right things, God just gives them to you. And it's that simple. It is that simple. So if you, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. As, look at this now, as the Father. Notice God is not just God. He's not just a supreme being on the edge of space that is angry all the time at us and is ruling over us and is just waiting for the day that he can squash us like bugs God is not that God if you are born again then God really is your father he is not the father of the old you he's the father of the new you if you're born again and he said as the father hath loved me so have I loved you continue ye in my love if ye keep my commandments which his commandments were love the Lord your God and then love your neighbor Ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in His love. I, I pointed this out last Sunday, that since Jesus kept the Ten Commandments, the law now has been satisfied, the law has been fulfilled, we finally have the one to satisfy the demands of the Old Testament law, now Jesus, as a lawgiver, comes down from heaven, like Moses did, but he brings us two commandments, not ten. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself. Turn to, um, oh boy, there's so much here I wanted. Go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And uh, I'll give you a second to turn there. And um, uh, Park and Hyun Mi, they go up to a Korean Bible study. Because he's still learning English. And I want you to pray for him. Because he... Uh, I mean, he's a good guy. I like the guy, but he is not very familiar with Bible Christianity. So pray for him that he learns English and that we can minister to him, that he can learn what he needs to learn about it. But anyway, uh, they invited us over. They got a brand new house. They invited us over uh, Monday and fed us. Um, boy, you ought to go over there and eat sometime. They made uh, some Korean barbecue. It's called bulgogi. And it was outstanding. So they wanted us over there to have a like a housewarming meal, and then they wanted a they wanted a blessing on their house. So this is the passage that God gave me to read over there, because it applies to the house and the home and things like that. But let's read this and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Deuteronomy six verse four: Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. This is where Jesus got that commandment. And these words which I command thee this day shall be where? In, if they are in your heart, then it is not a burden to fulfill it. If it's only in your head, in your conscience, then it can be a drag, it can be a burden... It can be a chore, it can be work, it can be labor, it might be hard. If, if, if I would tell you, pick your worst enemy, and then I command you to love them, you might do things on the outside as an expression of love, but you don't really love them in your heart, and the things that you're doing for them, you are forcing yourself to do it. And that's not fun. It's like 
being mad at your husband, but pretending you're not mad at your husband. Or your wife. Being mad at your wife, but your wife says, Honey, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong. I'm fine. But you're mad at her. You don't want, you don't hate her. You don't want to leave her. You don't want to throw her out. But it may be hard to love her. But if it's in your heart, she can make you mad all day long. And you'll still love her. And you'll love loving her. If it's in your heart. That's the difference. When the words are in your heart, it don't bother you to do what God said. Amen? Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Four things here. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. They shall be as frontless between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. The commandment to love God, if it's in your heart, it won't be hard to love Him. The commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, if it's in your heart, it won't be hard to love them. Now, I'm going to show you something from the Bible here in a little bit. Um, take your Bible, turn to... I'm skipping over a lot of this. Luke chapter 7. Turn to Luke chapter 7. Boy, there's a lot here and I don't have time for it. I want to get... So I'm just going to focus on the meat of the message. Luke chapter 7. And then let's pray. We need to pray. Father, come before you today and I ask your help to preach. I need your help to preach. Father, I thank you, God, for doing so much for me. I cannot ever repay you back for what you've done for me. Serving you today, Father, is not a problem. It's not a chore. It's not a job. It's not a labor. It's not hard. Because I am the only one in this world who really does actually know what you have done for me. Nobody else in this world can really fully comprehend what you've done for me. But because of what you've done for me, you have made it easy for me to love you and to serve you. It's not hard. It's the easiest thing I've ever done. And I thank you, Jesus, for yoking me to you and taking on your yoke because your burden is easy and your yoke is light. Father, give us wisdom today that will help us. Give us encouragement today that will move us along as we go through life. And Father, whatever it is, God, that you say to us, say it to our minds, but say it to our hearts. That way it will change us and it will be there forever. And no man can ever take that away. So, Father, I pray that you'd bless your word today and honor it. Open up our eyes and speak to us, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. We was talking about fathers and fatherhood. God is a father to those of us who have been born again. I mentioned this in Sunday school because in Sunday school I'm teaching about how cults corrupt the gospel. Usually there's an angelic messenger, there's some sort of evil angel that acts as a messenger that draws people away to false doctrine and false gospels and different things like that. And then they always add some performance of work along with grace and they say that's salvation, but salvation, there's no salvation in works, it's always grace. It's always God loving you and God forgiving you no matter what you've done. 
So I'm going to kind of poll the church this morning. I want you to look up here for a second. I'm going to ask you a question. Who in here, and I'm being dead honest, knows something about yourself that you think makes you probably the worst person here this morning? Would you raise your hand? And I will raise mine. I'm not kidding. To even be allowed in a pulpit uh, is nothing but the grace of Almighty God. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. But God has given it to me because of His love for me. Now, I use the example of two men in the Old Testament, the King Saul and King Solomon. And God said to David this, David, the son that's going to come out of your loins, prophetically he was speaking of Christ, but in a typical fashion he was speaking of Solomon. And he said, the son that comes out of your loins, he's going to build the temple that I'm not letting you build. And he said, I will be a father to him and he will be my son. This is the doctrine of the adoption of the saints. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. You and I are adopted in as the, as the sons of God. God, you were not birthed under God, but God took you in. This is what we're trying to do for those children in Kenya. We are taking them out of a dangerous situation. Those kids could die of starvation. In a week's time, they could be dead. And when I say rescue them, we are literally saving their life. So our hope is that we get to bring these children to us because of our love for them. And you can't help who you love. You just can't help it. When you love somebody, you love them. You remember when you were about 12, 13 years old and you put your eyes on some boy or some girl. First time. And you just sat and stared at them all day long. And you couldn't help it. You could not help. You just infatuated with them. Oh, I want them to be my girlfriend. I want them to be my boyfriend. And you just, there was just no way to get, get you out of that. Well, that's, that's how love operates. When you set your eyes on somebody, you just cannot help but love them. You don't even know them, but you love them. You care about them. You want them to be part. You want to give to them. You want to do for them. You want to be there for them. You just can't help it. So God looks at you and he says, I love you and I care about you. And I, I, want, you to, I want you to be in my family. I'm rich and I have, I have everything and I, you have nothing. And I want to share that with you. I want to give that to you. So that's what the adoption of sons is all about. How God looks at us in the pitiful state that we're in. We're naked and ashamed because of our sins and we're destitute. We're dirty and defiled and we're, and we're in the wilderness and we're hungry like those children. And God looks at us and He says, I love you and I've put my love on you and I've chosen you. And I'm going to give you everything that I'm going to give to my son Jesus. I'm going to share that with you so that you can live in my beautiful home for all of eternity. So that's what God did. God took Solomon. And he said, David, I'm going to choose your son. And he said, I'm going to be his father and he's going to be my son. And I'm going to give him everything that I have. And if he, and if he transgresses, if he breaks my law, if he sins, then I'm going to chasten him with the rod and with stripes. But my mercy will I never take from him. I will never not forgive his sins. That's what God promised. He said he'd do it. God, did, God is not a man that he should lie either. And I want you to think about Solomon. Oh, God gave Solomon wisdom, right? He gave him wisdom. But then God allowed Solomon to have, listen to this, men, to have everything that every man ever lusted after. Women, he had a thousand of them. A thousand women. All different types, all different nations, different tribes, different countries, different races. Solomon had one of each. 
He may have had a hundred of each. And he had chariots. And he had wine. And he would have parties at night with music. He built the house of God, took him seven years, but he spent 13 years building his own house. And God allowed him to do that. And because of the women that he married were from these other nations that had served other gods, Solomon's heart turned toward that and Solomon built his wife. You know how wise, honey, honey, I, that temple that you built for God, that's beautiful, but my gods don't have a house. Honey, would you build a house for my gods? And Solomon just said, I'll do it. And he did it. The Bible says Solomon loved many strange women. And that's where his heart went. And for 40 years, Solomon went and offered incense in those other temples to these other gods. He uh, had all these women. He had wine. He had music. He had chariots. He had other nations of the world coming and bowing to him and giving him exorbitant gifts. The Bible said that every, every year, people would bring him gold and silver. The Bible even mentions apes. Solomon had his own zoo going. So he literally, guys... Everything that every man has ever lusted after and said, boy, if I had that, I would be satisfied. Solomon had a dozen of them. And at the end of his, of his 40 years of having all that, he writes the book of Ecclesiastes and he said it was vanity. It was vexation. What I thought would bring me happiness has not brought anything to me at all. When I die, I'm going to lose every bit of it and it's going to be squandered among the inheritance of my children. They're going to go and blow the money that I've accumulated all my life. And that is exactly what happened. So Solomon, but he, he retained his wisdom. And for every sin that Solomon committed, God forgave every single one of them. Because he promised he would. Now, I want you to think about something. You ever had to go to your mom and dad and admit something to them that you did not want to admit? Confess something that you did not want to tell them? You ever done that? That's hard. That's hard. And you're not so much worried... You know, when you grow up, you're not so much worried about what they'll do to you. You're worried about what this will do to them. So I've had that experience. And then I had the experience of your children had to come to you. To confess something that they did and they didn't want you to find out about. That's hard. Because you didn't want your children to do things that you did. You wanted them to avoid the pain and the suffering of what sin brings. You know, we get older, we realize, Ron, that all that sin that we did, all that stuff we did back in the day, it didn't, it didn't, it didn't do for us what we thought it would do. It was, it was, it was, it hurt more than it did anything. And we bear the scars for the rest of our lives with these things. Here's what I'm getting at. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. One of the Pharisees desired that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Underline that in your Bible. A woman, which was a sinner. Well, women in the Bible are usually a type of a church. So I want to think that Bethel Church is this woman. And Bethel Church has sinners in it. Amen. 
We're a house full of sinners. And when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, And began to wash his feet with tears. And did wipe them with the hairs of her head. And kissed his feet. And anointed them with the ointment. Now the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it. He spake within himself saying. Now listen to this now. He's, he's not saying it out loud. That would be rude. But he's thinking it right. He's thinking it within himself saying. This man if he were a prophet. Would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. That sounds like a self-righteous crowd. And I'm sick of self-righteousness. I hate it. You know why I hate it so bad? Because it used to be who I was a long time ago. I used to be so arrogant, self-righteous. I don't see how God... Could have ever used me. I don't see. I don't understand it. My self-righteousness was not based upon how good I was at the time. It was based upon my elevated ego. That I was constantly. Trish. I was constantly bashing others. About their sins. And ignoring my own. The reason why I said Trish is that she knew I used to do that. So, verse 40. Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Verse 41. And you look at your Bible now. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now, that don't sound like much, but let's go back to a day when a man earned 30 cents a day. That may have been a while back, but when a man earned 30 cents a day, when he worked his tail off 10, 12 hours and he only earned 30 cents, that's a lot of money. 500 cents is a lot of money. Verse 42, when they had nothing to pay, you listen to this now. You have nothing to pay it back with. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore, Simon Peter, tell me this. Which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. Now you look at your Bible. And he turned to the woman. And said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears. And wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, look at your Bible, church, her sins, which were many, are forgiven. For she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they sat at meat with him, began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith have saved thee. Go in peace.
when my children, as adults, had to face me to tell me things that they did that hurt. Hurt my pride, hurt my ego, because I'm going, what will the church think of me? Did you hear what I just said? What will the church think of? And I was guilty of the sin of worrying about how I was going to look through all this, not them. And God used my wife to smite my heart. So I said, I forgive you. I forgive you. My girls... They loved their daddy. On top of feeding them, clothing them, trying to protect them, trying to shelter them, trying to raise them in church. But not really for that. It's because they know that if they do something wrong, daddy is going to forgive them. Because God has always forgiven me. And He always will. Always. So, the commandment then to love the Lord my God with all my heart, all my soul, all my might. I want you to hear those words because the flesh is not involved in that. And to be honest with you, my flesh does not like God very much. Neither does yours. So God knew then when he gave us that commandment, leave the flesh out of it because the flesh is wicked. The flesh is going to the grave. It's going to corrupt the, the, body of, the body of this flesh. Paul said there's no good thing in it anyway, so let it go to the grave and let it corrupt. But there's a new man inside of me that when it comes to loving God, Cubby, it is the easiest thing in the world that I've ever done in my life. And that is to love my father. You know, I wish my real, I wish my earthly dad was here. Because he would be sitting, he would always come on Father's Day and he would sit there. And to hear my dad say amen to something I preached. It, the whole church could have got up and left and I would have just preached to dad just to hear him say amen. But my dad always forgave me. And my heavenly father always Forgives me. Always. Uh, dads. Your children <clears throat> are going to have to come to you one of these days. And tell you some things they did. Don't forget to forgive them. No matter what it is. Can I hear somebody say amen? Don't make the sin of making that about you because it's not about you. Forgive them. And see, we think that 
when they tell us what, what they did, if we throw fit and scream and holler and punch the wall and kick the dog and curse and everything else, well, that'll scare them and I'll put the fear of God in them. They'll never do that again. So that's our nature. That's our flesh doing that. But let me tell you something, how it really works. If you forgive them, they will never forget that as long as they live. And then they will love you. And they will work and strive in their life to never hurt daddy that way ever again. I'm telling you, that's how it works. Why? Because you loved them. And now they are going to love you. Because to whom much is forgiven, to them they love much. And it's not the righteous or the self-righteous or the people who haven't done very much wrong that love God. It's the ones who've done terrible things. They're the ones who love God. And they don't need a commandment to do it. They just already do it. I want you to bow your head. First thing I'm going to ask is, what do you need to confess? Your Father in heaven, who loves you, Your sin was against Him. You sinned because you didn't, you didn't appreciate God. You didn't love God the way you should have. That's why you sinned. That's why you did it. So, my first question is, what do you need to confess to God, your Father? What sins do you need to call out to Him knowing that though He might still have to chasten you He might still have to whip you but He's going to do it because He loves you and you know He does because He does chasten you Hebrews 12 says those whom He loves He chastens just like a father. We had fathers that chastened us for their benefit. But when God chastens us, it is for your benefit. It is for our benefit. He's helping us so that we don't do wrong anymore. So what do you have to confess to God today? Number one, He's your father. And you owe Him that on Father's Day. Number two, who, is, who has sinned against you that you haven't forgiven? Holding unforgiveness in your heart is the, is the heaviest bondage I can think of holding a grudge, holding unforgiveness. That's like dragging a ship's anchor behind you. Best thing you can do is let it go, cut off that burden. Who in here loves God? If you love God, you'll keep His commandments, and His commandments are not hard. Just love God, love your neighbor as yourself. We're going to talk about that. 
probably next week, maybe. But who in here needs to love God more? So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to give you a moment for you to talk to your father on Father's Day. For you to confess, for you to ask for help. Hey, he's, he's rich. You can even ask him for money every now and then, you know what? But he's your father. And because he has forgiven you of so much, he's easy to love. It just comes out naturally. I'm going to open up this altar this morning. If you want to come down here, I'll give you the chance. I'll pray with you down here. We'll talk about whatever you need to talk about or whatever. But we're going to have a time of prayer this morning. And if you'd like to come down, now's the time. I'm not saying you have to. I quit trying to sell the altar call years ago. I don't think that just because you didn't come to the altar, that the sermon didn't mean anything. But tell God you love Him this morning. Tell Him thank you for forgiving you for everything. And when you said, God, I won't do that no more, you went and did it again. Did God still forgive you? Sure He did. Sure He did. Then you get to a point where you say, God, why did you forgive me so much? I kept doing it. God, why did you keep forgiving me? The answer you get back is, I love you. And I adopted you. So you're my son now. I got to say this, and I want you to just hear me for a second. You can stay with your head bowed, but several years ago, my wife brought over to me a little boy, six months old, put him on my lap, and she said, his parents don't want him. He's going to be up for adoption. And I knew what she was getting at. And I told her, honey, I'll pray about it. She knew I, that, she knew I meant it. Because God had been dealing with me about being a husband to my wife and loving my wife and giving to my wife. So for two weeks, I told God, I said, God, I want to I give this to my wife. But I have to love him. Because if I don't love him, I won't raise him right. If I whip him, I'll just be doing it in anger, not in love. And I don't want that. So God, if you want me to take him, you have to make me love him. Like he's my own son. Some of you here know, know how that feels, know what that's like. Short story is two weeks later, God did that. And when I think about my relationship with God, I am a son by adoption, which means that God picked me. Why? Because He loved me before He ever, before I ever did anything. God picked me, and God loves me, and it's easy to love him back. Heavenly Father, I come before you today, and I thank you, God, for the blessing of being loved. There's nothing in the world like it. And Father, we as a church have chosen to love four children that we've never met. We don't know what kind of people they are. We don't know what they're going to do in life. But we just, we can't help but love them.
We loved him. As soon as we laid eyes on him, we loved him. And we want to give them everything because they have nothing. And Father, that's how I was when you saw me. I had nothing. And you had everything. And you didn't need me. But you loved me. And I will never get over that as long as I live. Father, thank you for loving us, for choosing us. And every time, Father, we fail you, you never stopped loving us, ever. And we know, Father, by your word, that you're not going to ever stop loving us. So, Father, thank you for bringing us into your family. And we thank you, God, for forgiving us of very much. And because of that, loving you is never hard. We thank you, God, for speaking to us today. We thank you, God, for helping us today. We ask, dear God, that you continue to go with us. Whenever we get out of line, take a rod to us. Because then we'll know that you love us. And you still love us. Help us to love you more, we pray. In Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Stand to your feet.